This week, we talk about the Chevrolet Blazer that we just added to our test fleet, the 2020 Subaru Legacy sedan, and the cars that broke our hearts. Next on Talking Cars. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Talking Cars. I'm John Linkove. I'm Keith Barry. I'm Mike Quincy. And this week we've got some pretty interesting news from the most recent Chicago Auto Show, which was a couple weeks ago in the whole polar vortex. Mm -hmm. Keith, one of the cars that they showed, uh, you know, again, near and dear, Subaru Legacy. Can you yeah. tell us a little about that? Now, we, we love the Legacy. Uh, it's on our recommended list, and there have been a couple of changes to it this year. Um, it, um, it gets some new engine choices, it gets a new turbo, and it gets a new giant touchscreen. Okay. So the turbo uh, for the new XT version, that's kind of a cool idea. The giant touchscreen, I'm not entirely sure about. Uh, what do you folks think? Have well, you seen it? You know, one of the things that's interesting with, with some of the Subarus, Mike, uh, is that they drop the turbo from the Forester, and everyone complained, oh my gosh, there's no more turbo in the <laughs> Forester. Mm -hmm. So now, in addition to the four-cylinder, I believe, is the is the base engine. You get this new turbocharged engine. Um, yeah, they dropped the six. Well, yeah, they, they, they dropped, dropped the, the six. six. Right, right, which, right. Which did really well in, in Consumer Reports test. I mean, it's, it was always quiet and smooth and Strong. Kind, of, kind, of, kind of an, uh, an underappreciated uh, trim line of the Legacy. I mean, I was thinking about this, and I, I was thinking how you know, Subaru is kind of edgy because they have a car like the WRX, mm -hmm. you know, a hyper turbocharged sports sedan. Right. And when it comes to maybe you know more mainstream mature sedans, what what other uh, you know brand is putting out something that might be as edgy as a turbocharged Legacy? Yeah, that, that's yeah. you know you, you you get some uh, Ford Fusion. You know, as mm -hmm. you know, as you move up, you know, the titanium is is sporty, but, but that is, car is going away. It, it is, right. and, mm -hmm. and you know, there's there isn't like you said, a you know, a a, a huge amount number of of these performance affordable sedans right. that are out there. And with all wheel drive, there's right, right. I mean, the Altima just added all wheel drive, but aside from that, something that's affordable. I mean, this this legacy is. Is going to be pretty much it. But, so, you, but you bring yeah, up a good point about you know when Subaru dropped the turbo engine of the Forester. You know, yeah, are, are people going to get are people going to get excited about this, and then not buy it? You know, well, like you know, they did with the Turbo Forester. Well, I'll see. One thing that may be interesting is that replacement for the Turbo Forester will be a Turbo Outback right. because the Outback is based on the Legacy. Yeah, and you we know, already get a sense that I mean, a couple of dealers are even saying like, "Hey, you, you you're wondering what the new what the new Outback's going to look like, and it's probably going to debut later this year. Just take a look at the new Legacy and imagine just a little wagon little shape wagon. on the back. You know, one thing you mentioned is the big touchscreen. Is it is it like the Dodge Ram uh, upscale touchscreen, or you know, is it like a Tesla touchscreen, or is it just like this? You you know, iPad Mini. You know, honestly, it, it reminds me of, and don't you know, don't don't kill me here because this is this is going to be a, a, but it reminds me a little of the of the the big census screen in the Volvos because okay. it does control climate control. But so there aren't those work hard better than the Volvos. Yeah, but screen. still with climate control, <laughs> I, I I need my hard buttons so I can just reach and just touch something. I don't want to take my <laughs> eyes off the road in order to turn on a defroster or something like well, that. Or so, if, it, if it blanks, if it resets, if it goes out, mm -hmm. you know, then I've I've been in. The them, I've been in some of our test cars where the screen is blank and mm -hmm. then all of a sudden you know you're driving with someone and and the windows fog up and you know you're lowering the windows in the winter because you have so much body heat in the, in the outside the condensation that forms in the fog you know you run into trouble yeah you know, so I, I do agree and That's Subaru is that sort of no-nonsense brand where people who want something you know people who would have bought a Volvo 20 years ago uh, you know they want it seems to be from what we hear from Subaru buyers that they like the fact that it's it's a you know it's a no-nonsense car it's all-wheel drive it's practical is this gonna turn people off are people and, gonna walk in and say mm, no thanks and they didn't do that with the Ascent so yeah we're, we're gonna the Ascent SUV they're big Three yeah. SUV. We're going to keep our eye on it, but it kind of led us to talking a little bit with uh, with the Valentine's Day week, uh, you know, about about cars that we loved but missed out on. You know, people love this the Subaru Legacy, but is there something that we each loved that you know we weren't either we didn't buy it or we owned it and wish we did? You know, and I think Mike, you came up with the idea, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah, the, the idea was you know cars that cars that broke your heart, yeah, right, there and you go. and um, and the, the first thing that I thought of was um, all the Volkswagen turbo diesels. 
broke mm. broke my heart. So being a road trip guy, that the the Volkswagen turbo diesel was always my go-to car. So when it had the emissions scandal yep. and they dropped them all from the lineup, because I had recommended turbo diesel Volkswagens to dozens of people. Oh, sure. And then all of a sudden they come back to me and like, now what do I do? And I'm like, oh, it's God. Hard. So, yeah. I mean, I, I loved these cars, but um, they, they totally. They lied to they you. Totally the relationship bro- they totally was built broke on a lie. Yep. Yeah. You know? yeah. Terrible. I mean, there, there have been fixes. But we haven't tested them, and you know we're not endorsing. But, but, any they, of but the, they just, they, the just they broke, either. they broke some sure, trust. Sure, sure. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, it was a car that I loved, and now I'm just, Spurned. I just, I just kind of like it. you know drop my head and go, oh man, that's it. Just killed diesels in the United States. Yeah, mm-hmm. it really did. It did, Keith. So mine's more, mine's a little more personal. Mine, mine is a little more personal story. Is that when I was when I was 18 years old, I had about four thousand dollars that saved up to buy a, on a car, and because like all 18 year olds, I was a genius, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I thought I realized something that nobody else in the world had ever had ever realized. And that was like four years ago. <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it, you, it was that you could you could go out there and buy a really really expensive car as long as you got one that had depreciated a ton. Sure. So I bought a I bought a an X three hundred XJ six. Jaguar. Okay. Yes. Oh, uh, little yeah. did I realize at the time wow. uh, that you know it, it one of the VINs on it had a, had a salvage title, but the other one didn't. So that was fine. <laughs> I got it registered, uh, and you know I drove it. I, I felt like a million bucks. I was going to the kind of college where you know it wasn't uncommon to see Porsche Cayennes in the student parking lot. And how here was, was the, how was the country club? Uh, I, seriously, <laughs> okay. but here was I. You know, definitely not that. And I felt like I I kind of you know people were looking at me and I, I felt I was really really cool and I was learning a bit about the car and I was you know getting under the hood a little and doing a little uh, and and then uh, then the exhaust system you had triple a on speed had, uh, no no actually it was a remarkably I mean it had 142,000 miles on it and this car I was no problem for road trips everything mm-hmm. But the thing that killed me was it needed a new exhaust system from the cat back. And the parts alone in that at the time were, were almost as much as I paid for the car. Wow. So I sold it to someone, he fixed it up, and, 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 and you know, the relationships, that happens with him. But the thing that really the killed me- The friend or the car? No, no, the car, uh, okay. the car. Yeah. The, thing that, the, the thing that really, really killed me with this though is that, and that really broke my heart, is that I Googled the VIN one day. Don't ever do that. If you, if you have a car that you like really love, don't ever look up to see what happened to it. <laughs> Because it was on the list from Cash for Clunkers. Uh, and it had been crushed like a mile from my house. Wow. And it was just one of those things I could just like, you know, hear what the sound of that wood <laughs> splintering in the hydraulic press would sound like. Even worse of what you would have gotten for that, maybe. I know, I know. I, I will oh. actually, I, I sold it for less than what the, you know, yeah. but still, you know, it's a, it pays some respect. Some, some, I, I'm sorry. That that killed I'm on the edge of my seat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Waiting what's to yours? Hear what's your, what's your story? Your well, you know, the one thing I'll say is there's a reason why the depreciates like well a of course i found that out now which is why i'm a consumer journalist young, Mine, young <laughs> so mine's it mine's the opposite um so it's probably oh, 15 years ago talking to a friend of mine when you were 18 when i was <laughs> when i was 12 um this is new math saying you know when when you get your license and and you make your first million dollars at your first job you gotta buy a porsche rs america and then at that point they were they were and I want to say in the 30s, maybe thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollar range. And this is a car that a lot of people kind of looked at and said, uh, you know, they they decontented it when it came out. It was a 911 that they, you know, they had pull door hand, you know, pull latches and all to save weight to save yeah. weight. But they didn't days. give it any. They didn't give it any performance enhancements. And and people kind of looked at it like, well, America's not getting the real one that they had in, in Germany. And it just lack of love. Well, now. They're ninety thousand. They're a hundred thousand. They're a hundred plus. And people, people love people, those decontented. Yes. They're authentic. <laughs> yep. Now they're authentic. That's a farm to table Porsche. It is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There you <laughs> go. There, it's sustainable yeah. and all. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's just one of those things. Like if, if if you scrape up money, you know, take out a stupid loan or something. Here's a car that it could have been really fun, and then. You know, it has a lot of value. It, didn't, so, so it wasn't it, like it got away. It wasn't like I had. I was gonna say it, it, you, you, you broke know. your heart because you didn't buy one. Or? Yeah, it broke my heart because it was it was a, it was been a smart buy. It uh-huh. didn't. I didn't have that that you know lapis blue one waiting for me. You know, around the corner. It, uh-huh. it just was one of those things. Like it was an opportunity. It was a smart buy. Um, it would have been fun. I was single. You know, I had some cash from living at home a long time. Um, <laughs> you know, that that would that would have worked out. So you know, we, we each have our own story. You know, I'm sure everyone's got a story. You, you can let us know. Send us uh, send us some stories about one that got away. Talkingcars at iCloud.com. 
Uh, that's going to give us some movement to a car that we just got in, um, kind of, you know, a historical historical name. By name. Uh, yeah. The Chevrolet Blazer. You know, we, we just got this SUV in. Uh, it's a two-row model. Uh, takes on a couple a couple big competitors. Um, and it fills a niche for, for Chevrolet, Mike. Well, it, it's, it goes along the, the, the theme that we always talk about in Talking Cars is, is SUV saturation. Every manufacturer wants to have a, an SUV of every shape size, price range, or whatnot. Uh, the Blazer certainly comes in with, with, you know, it's not really a negative baggage, it's probably positive baggage. Most people think back yeah. to the Blazer, they think about the big SUV from the 1970s, not the Trail Blazer, which was absolutely abysmal. Or the, or S- the, the S10 testing. based yeah, Blazer yeah, is what yeah, I yeah. think of, and that's that um, kind of cool, you know. It's, I owned one, it wasn't cool. And, no. and, and for, <laughs> for some people, like like when, in my household, uh, my, my teenagers, are too big for a third row seat. Even when they were younger, we rarely used a third row seat. So I can see the appeal of this. Uh, and as we talked about in, in a previous episode, the, the Honda Passport, again, I, I kind of yep. like that idea of, of just a, 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 a very, a, really a utility vehicle, because I'm not going to be using the third row. Right. Um, uh, but when you mentioned before about climate uh, buttons and being able to to be able to see things. Oh my God. That's one of the things going <laughs> against the blazer, right? Well, well, you know, Keith, you've you've spent some time and I think all of us have driven it a bit. You know, yeah. what, what about the buttons? Because I have my own opinion on it. So it took me a while to find them because <laughs> there is this sort of ridge that, that sort of protrudes from the inside of the center console and it seems to have no other purpose other than to obscure every physical hard button control in the car. And I tried a ton of different seating positions. I asked you to make sure that it wasn't just the car was designed as an anathema to, to, to my ergonomics. Well, because we all have different size bodies. Yeah. But it seems like, you know, walking around the offices at, at, at Consumer Reports Test Track, they're also, everyone's saying the same thing. Yeah. It's yeah. almost like a design element uh, that, that GM is moving to because we found a similar thing in the Cadillac XT4, the, the small, their comp, subcompact, their compact SUV. Um, also, oddly enough, it's, it's as if they haven't sold enough Camaros right. because <laughs> they have the giant Camaro uh, you know, uh, vents, vents down low. And they're cool in some ways. You know, look, you know, the, turning them on and off is pretty easy. They have the temperature controls. It's like a rotary It's a rotary yeah. But it just... I don't get this whole like, well, it's got Camaro elements in this two row SUV. And yeah. like, it feels yeah. like an XT4 that someone looked at and said, you know what, let's make this look more like a Camaro. And, and yeah. it's not like the Camaro sells in yeah. great numbers. I mean, yeah, yeah. The GM is basically saying, yeah, we know that the Ford sells more Mustangs than we do. I mean, I have yeah. another climate related, but it's more of a sort of global climate change related concern about these SUVs. And the more these come out, I, I just, you know, I, I, we see, you know, gas mileage in the high teens is, I guess, mm-hmm. as we're driving. It around, yeah, not right. this one, you know, formally, yeah, but yeah. Over, overall, and you know, we test these obviously, but and on average, these these don't get the best fuel right. economy. And out we got there. the V6 model, and I feel like so. we're living on an island, and we've got like three trees left, and we need we need shelter, and we need heat. But we're going to cut down those trees and lift up our houses a few feet. Yeah. It just feels like it's just not the best use of, of where this great technology can go in design. I, I, that's that's me. That's me. So but, so. You know, Ford Edge is a competitor on mm-hmm. the, the new Honda Passport. Mm-hmm. Um, Murano. Like showed, the mm-hmm. Nissan Murano and the Santa Hyundai Fe. Santa Fe. Right. Mm-hmm. Is this class needed? I mean, is it, is it, there's it's a niche wanted. and we have to put a car in there to compete. But, you know, a lot of people buy three row SUVs. We had, my wife and I had a, had a, you know, 2010, had our baby, our, our daughter. Um, and the, we had a Volvo XC70 previous generation wagon and it fit pretty well. Hard to put the car seat in, the, the infant seat in facing, you know, rear facing. But at some point, my wife was like, oh, we need an SUV and we need a three row SUV we and we're going to be row. carrying right. people around. I just don't find it. It could be where I live. Everyone is just so active with all their kids, different activities that you never carpool because they're all going, <laughs> they're all going different directions. Um, but I mean, is, is a two row yeah. world needed or is it just, look, we're three row world. Should an SUV vehicles? just be, you know, a, a large, I, I mean, obviously people, if you're going to make choices, people are going to buy them. Mm-hmm. And I'm, and I'm not against making choices out there for, you know, a, a key for every lock, but, <laughs> but right. at the same time, it, it does feel like Did that, you say a Keith for every a lock? A key for yeah. every lock. No, very different. No, none of these are for Keith. Uh, but there's, you know, it's a slightly, it's, 
it feels a, a, like a, a bit of overkill. I, I, I don't know what, yeah. the, what the solution it, 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 that is, and obviously it's not having everyone driving a Nissan Leaf, but at the same time... It's, it, it's, it's, what, the, it's what the market is sort of demanding, yeah. but, but as we started this whole Chicken segment... Chicken and egg, though? Well, but, but Subaru is sticking with the legacy. Yeah, yeah. So they're mm-hmm. saying, you know, we know that everyone wants SUVs, and we're going to offer one from every shape and size practically, well, they which is basically what they do. Yeah. But mm-hmm. they're saying, you know, we're also committed to sedans. And I think that's cool. I'm, I, I, I love driving sedans. I, 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 mm-hmm. As I've said many times, I get just a little bit saturated with SUVs yeah. all the time. Sure. So speaking of driving, speaking of driving the legacy, what is the experience of the Blazer so far? What have you guys felt? I'll go Keith first. That way we don't all just go. I, yeah, I, there's, there's nothing. It's certainly not a Camaro. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing special about it in either direction. I mean, I just, I, there's nothing about it that, that, that grabs me. It, it, it's, I mean, I, it's pleasant. It's, there's nothing that, mm-hmm. that upsets me. J- John and I used think? to work with an editor that hated that word. Yeah, pleasant. yeah, pleasant. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but it's almost damning with faint praise in a sense. Oh, exactly, uh, exactly. What do you, I mean, what do you, what do you think? I, I think it, it, to me, it comes down to dr- driving the Blazer is like driving uh, in, in a shoebox. I mean, the visibility mm. to me mm. kills the experience okay. because the, the, the rear visibility is really compromised by the styling. Uh, the dashboard seems high. The glass area seems low. Uh, it feels very closed in. Uh, the model that we got does not have a sunroof, so the interior is not brightened up very much. And it's a black interior, uh, black yeah. leather. Right. Or yeah, black, yeah. Yeah. So, so to me, it, it's just kind of dour. I mean, I, I, I like the way it looks, but I think GM is, is, is really banking on people kind of in love with the name that, that they're going yeah, to flock to and buy that. I, I was surprised that for a $40,000 plus SUV, no sunroof. Well, right. Mm-hmm. It, you know, that, it's also that kind of a lousy baffling. value right, also. Right. But I, I, I agree with Keith. It, it is very unremarkable the way it drives. It's like, mm. it's okay. That's a better word than pleasant. It's, yeah. it's okay, yeah. but, but I don't... I don't, I don't find myself, you know, running to the keyboard and getting my name on it before other people, well, so you, I can have it. The, the previous Ford Edge was, is, it was, is, I mean, you know, they haven't, we haven't finished testing of the, the redesign of it, but it was a little sporty. It, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a sporty vehicle, maybe compromised other ways, but it was, it was sporty. Um, the ostensibly, Hyundai Santa, yeah, ostensibly the Passport is a little bit sportier. Right. True. True. The Hyundai Santa Fe was an enjoyable car and, and uh, SUV. And I had this over the weekend with the kids, and it was easy to get in and out, and the doors open pretty wide, and yep, the, the dash is high. But again, yeah, unremarkable. And I think my kids actually walk to a different red SUV. Now they're little, <laughs> but you know, I'm beeping it, and they're like, is this the one? Or is I got to say, it, the it first time we had it, I had trouble finding it in the, in the, in the parking lot the first time I took it, because I didn't but, know what color it was. And, and the whole reason this exists is to be distinctive. Right. But, right. but as in a market crowded with SUVs, I mean, it's good for consumers because they have a lot of choices. Mm-hmm. Unremarkable isn't... Good enough. Well, it's no Murano. I mean, the Murano is almost it's polarizing, you know, right. well, the looks of it. But, but the right. Santa Fe but, is a car you can get in, and they didn't make it expensive, but the interior, at least, right. it, yeah. it, 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 it gives you something different. It, yeah. It's a cool, well, it's more than pleasant. We're right. putting <laughs> our miles on it. Uh, we're going to have uh, some information on consumerreports.org, our first drive of it. Uh, we so, already have it up, yep. actually up, and a video's up. Yeah, too. so, so yeah. check that mm-hmm. out. We're going to move now to a really good segment. Uh, we've got a couple good questions that people have sent in. Once again, send your questions, send your video questions in, talkingcars at iCloud.com. First one is from uh, Henry S. And he says, in a recent show, you endorsed undercarriage washes during the winter. Can this force salt into the wheel wells between the sheet metal and the wheel well liner into an area where it will never leave? I have done undercarriage washes on my car for a few years and recently had rust a start under the paint in the wheel well area. Keith, you actually have a story about that, again, on consumerreports.org. Yep. Um, you know, what do you, what do you think, what do you, advice you have for Henry? Yeah, so we do still endorse undercarriage washes. And it's, or suggest. Uh, suggest them, yeah. yeah. And, and f- for the, the same reason um, that you're having a rust issue is that stuff tends to get caught in places that don't otherwise get washed. The issue is that, is that an undercarriage wash, no matter how many times you do it, it's not going to clean absolutely everything out of there. I've seen this happen on 
cars. And that's one of the hardest places to, to get, you know, that, that sort of salty, you know, when salt kind of turns into like a paste mm -hmm. with road grime and mm -hmm. it sits there, it's going to get wet no matter what. And, you know? and, and rust never sleeps. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, true. Very exactly. True. So, I, I mean, I, I hesitate to, you know, create a counterfactual here, but I imagine that this might have, your car might have rusted even a little more if you hadn't done those under uh, undercarriage sure. washes. So, no, it's not like it's it's pushing it up there. Um, but, I mean, the other thing, especially this time of year, that it, that it does is, um, you know, if you live in a place where they salt the roads and you really get stuff that's caked on under there, this, an undercarriage wash is, is just going to blast it off. And yeah. sometimes it's, yeah. a, it's an option it, at, when you go to, to an automated, uh, automatic, uh, automated uh, a car, car wash. wash yeah. mm. they, they, they often will charge you extra, or they'll it's ask. It's usually two or three dollars extra, yeah. yeah. I would say in, in, in the wintertime, it's not a bad idea because there are all these nooks and crannies and there's sound deadening and there are these panels and and you know most of the time rust proofing these days is very good mm -hmm. but 10 15 years ago I don't know how old your car is well that's one that's, that's one another question we don't know too. the age of it we don't know you know maintenance not saying Henry's not taking care of it obviously. no no He's watching it but you never know um, you know information online about that because there's a whole host of uh, car wash advice you know from coatings and washes mm. waxes etc uh, we're gonna move to Paul uh, Paul says, longtime fan, love the show. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> I was recently told by a Honda dealer that automatic emergency braking only works during cruise control, regardless of the manufacturer. Is this oh. really true? Oh. Mike. <laughs> Another one of those times when, when a, a car salesperson maybe doesn't quite have their facts right. Uh, no, this is not true. Uh, I spoke with our safety experts here at the track, and they definitely confirmed that uh, with automatic emergency braking, cruise control does not yeah. have to be uh, activated. Uh, I certainly found this out for myself. We were I was driving uh, our Lexus ES test car the other day, uh, pulling into my son's school, and I found a parking spot, and there was a lamp post. Uh, in the front of the parking spot, and I, I got to within a few inches of it, and, and all of a sudden the brakes jammed up. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't think, I, I thought it was a little bit premature, but it obviously did the job, and I obviously was not also using cruise control to pull mm. into the parking spot. I've had that with pulling into my garage to, in different vehicles, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and it just depends. You know, maybe you're, you're feathering the brake, you're going in a little quickly, and it just doesn't know, but certainly. Every, every right. manufacturer mm -hmm. is, is different the way they, they program their sensitivities, right, right. but uh, no, definitely. But it's independent of automatic cruise control. Well, exactly. one thing I got to say on this, though, is that it highlights the fact that, that, first of all, a lot of buyers don't understand how these systems work, and also that a lot of dealers don't understand, and right. they might just tell you something just to make sure that you, just to, to move you along. Right. Now, but the thing is that, that, I, that I really want to make sure is that automatic emergency braking is not the thing that will slow the car if there's traffic. Right, automatic right. Right. emergency braking is sort of that last resort and it might not even be enough to actually stop the car and avoid a crash so it gonna, doesn't it'll limit the impact and limit yes, the severity right. of it but right. so it doesn't mean automatic emergency braking isn't the thing that where you can take your foot off the brake and the car will just slow itself down right, right, right. but with that with with the uh with the automatic uh cruise control, sensing cruise control distance sensing cruise control that's going to be the thing that's going to slow you down when you have traffic coming up ahead you automatic know, emergency braking and those those are two totally different things you know like one thing you both touched on we the dealers and this isn't to knock the dealers because there's a lot of technology coming out oh yeah it's kind of coming out like right. this we picked up i picked up the ipace that we are testing the jaguar ipace and the the salesman and he's this he was a man, sales manager and he was really great i mean he was great through the whole thing but he said to me like you know, there's just so much new technology on this car it's hard to just get a grasp of everything with it you know and we can set, there's so many settings now there's so mm. many menus there's so many ways to to get the car to the personalized, so to speak, and let it, alone just the technology of what type of charger works on an electric okay. car, et cetera. So and, and reading this question, it reminded me of the days when anti-lock brakes were, were new. Stability yeah. control mm. was new. That wasn't standard on every car. Sure. And I, I think the salespeople either didn't know much about it or they weren't stocking the cars with yeah, this exactly. equipment. And so they would often say, ah, you don't need that. Well, yeah, a, you don't I, need that. As it proliferates throughout the market, you know, expect to have it. Right. But it's also a key thing for people to think about don't just get in the dealer, go to the finance and insurance guy, sign the papers and get out. Mm. Now with cars, you really do have to, you know, book a bunch, book some time to make sure you go over. And, and, do, and, and do even on the test your, drive, do, do your, your research. Yeah, yeah, do your research, know find what, out what packages. Know what, it does, be, know what the cars can do even before you get to the dealer. So you can be an opportunity right, to know right. more about the car. You know what's a great well, place to do that research? 
ConsumerReports.org? Well, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> yeah. check, out, check it out on ConsumerReports.org <laughs> because we have a whole list of uh, wow. all the current 2019s and even some of the 2018s, the cars with advanced safety systems and which are standard and which are optional. And that, that's mm -hmm. a big thing to know because it's hard sometimes to figure it out. Um, our final question, questions kind of merge together. Um, mm. First one is from Nathaniel S. Dear Talking Cars, in a recent episode when you were discussing cargo room in a new Lexus, Jennifer mentioned, Jennifer Stockberger, mentioned some ways that you guys measure cargo room. How do you measure cargo space and how does the, fa the factor into your overall ratings? Well, you know, so I'll jump on this, that the way we do test it is that we use something, we use a big pipe frame box. And basically it's adjustable you know, for height and for width and for depth. And we fit it into vehicles that are hatchbacks or uh, SUVs. And minivans. And minivans, exactly. Because you'll see these, these ratings of the XYZ, you know, the 2019 brand new has 48 cubic feet of storage space. And that's maybe if you're filling it with ping pong balls. Mm -hmm. And if you're filling it with ping pong balls, that's a fantastic part of your clown job. I, I don't know what you do, <laughs> you know, on the weekends. But you steal from the ping pong you factory. You steal from at. the ping pong factory and then yeah. you have your own. But basically that's not always usable. You know, if, if, if the opening is this big and the cargo space is this big, you're only getting a, a, a small long object in right. there. So what we do is we measure the usable space of the, of the um, basically the frame, you know, where the cargo, you know, where the hatch and the cargo door open, you know, and then what you could fit in there. So, you know, it would be great to know you could fit a refrigerator in there. You may not have 38.5 cubic feet of, of overall, you know, you may have that space, but you can't fit a refrigerator in the car if it has a tiny opening. So, or if it has a sloping rear or end. A sloping or rear end, because you want to, you know, we do it with closing the hatch. So, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's great. You could, you could fit, you know, a four by eight sheet of plywood or something out the back, but you're going to have to have the flag hanging. We, ch we test what you could have in the vehicle with the hatch closed. Mm -hmm. um, the other question that's kind of associated, Jake says, hi, on top of recently getting a dog, my wife and I are hoping to adopt and could need a bigger vehicle with no notice. I would be replacing a 2013 Hyundai Elantra and would like to improve on its fuel economy, mostly highway driving, while adding around 30 cubic feet of cargo space for the dog. A used Prius V, Toyota Prius V fits the bill, but we don't like the cheap interior materials and lethargic acceleration. Are there any alternatives with above average reliability ratings that are under $20,000 with a less than 75,000 miles? We each came up with our own. I'm going to toss this one to Keith first. All right. I, I say, I say, you know, treat yourself. You're starting, a, you know, you're starting a new family. Uh, you, you, you might have to go for a car that's a little bit older, but uh, my recommendation is the Lexus RX. Uh, stellar, uh, stellar reliability in, in, in our in our tests. The, the 08 to 2010, really nice interior, really quiet. It's got a ton of space, and there also is a hybrid version of right. it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not going to get Prius V fuel economy, but it's not going to be a huge dip from the from the Elantra. And yeah, it's a bigger car, but you know, you're going to be able to have that reliability and that. Uh, that comfort yep. as well that you're looking for. Mike and I initially kind of thought of the same one, almost like a mind meld. It, it, just, it just came out of our, <clears throat> our mouth at the same time. Yeah. like Mazda 5. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mazda 5 is this really kind of obscured little uh, cross between a wagon and a minivan. Uh, the cool thing about the Mazda 5, it had dual sliding side doors. Mm -hmm. uh, it had room for six. It had uh, a decent cargo room inside. Uh, the four-cylinder engine didn't have a lot of power. Uh, and and it, and the handling was was made it kind of agile, kind of fun to drive. Yeah. The, the downside of this car, they didn't sell a lot of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. so it might be hard to find one. Right. But but um, we we have a we've known a, a few people that we've worked with yep. uh, in the communications office yeah, yeah. who uh, bought one for his family and really liked it. And uh, it's like kinda, a mini minivan. Yeah, we're kind of exactly. sad yeah. to see that go out of production. Actually. Well. There's a lot of cars out there. I would suggest that, uh, Jake, you go take a look at consumerreports.org and look at our best used cars under $20,000. There's also some list best under 30 if you happen to be able to bump it up a bit. But a lot of cool information on there, particularly for CR members. So that's going to do it for this episode. As always, check the show notes for what we talked about. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.